Welcome to our program entitled Focus on Ophthalmology for Pharmacists. Hi, I'm Peter Krekel. I'm an assistant professor of pharmacology at St. Francis University in Loretto, Pennsylvania. There I teach pharmacology to a class of 55 students. All of them are in their last year of didactic studies at St. Francis University, and they're preparing pharmacology for their clinical rotations. I'm also a pharmacist at Thompson Pharmacy on Broad Avenue in Altoona, Pennsylvania, an independently owned retail operation that's uh, rather busy, so I get the best of both worlds, academia as well as retail practice. Let's review our learning objectives. We're going to list the principles of drug therapy for the eyes and when to refer to a medical practitioner. We'll identify the most common ophthalmological disease states and treatments commonly available in the retail pharmacy. We'll outline the role of drug therapy responsible for elevations in intraocular pressure and other ocular side effects that are caused by those medications. We're going to describe the role of the pharmacist counseling with regard to therapeutics geared towards management of common diseases of the eyes. I'd like to give a special thank you to Rachel Fritz from the class of 2014 from Salus College of Optometry in Philadelphia. Rachel also is my niece. And also to Dr. Mark D'Souza. Dr. Mark is an ophthalmologist trained over in India. He came to the United States and he is currently a practicing physician assistant. Mark graduated from St. Francis in the physician assistant class of 2012. They've completely reviewed this program for content and I greatly appreciate their expertise. Let's talk about exclusions to self-care. Well, there's a lot of conditions that I have listed here that are way out of our realm of expertise and we'll need to refer these people to a specialist immediately. Any kind of blunt trauma and as we all know baseball is probably the most common cause of blunt force trauma followed by basketball. Foreign particles trapped or embedded in the eye. Ocular abrasions. Infections of the eyelid or eye surface. Eye exposure to a chemical splash, solid chemicals or chemical fumes. Superglue damage can also be a big problem. Thermal injury to the eye, bacterial conjunctivitis, and chlamydial conjunctivitis can all cause problems that need to be referred. So the question might be, what's superglue damage? Well, superglue damage uh, can happen because it's a very small container that sometimes can be confused for an ophthalmic ointment. Uh, more commonly, though, what happens is when a person's trying to twist that cap off the superglue container, um, it squirts into their eyes. That is indeed an ocular emergency. Let's talk a little bit about the principles of drug therapy. Drugs must cross the cornea to act within the eye. They must be lipophilic or uncharged, and we need to adjust the pH so weak bases or weak acids can produce a larger portion of uncharged or unionized molecules. Most eye drops are sterile products, and the action of some drugs is related to eye color. Black and brown irises contain more pigment than the green or gray or blue irises do. Therefore, the more pigment contained in the iris, the darker the iris, the more drug can bind to it, and it results in a slower onset of action and a longer duration of action. So even the iris color has a lot to do with drug therapy. Here are some important counseling points to review. First of all, there are no FDA-approved anti-infective products available over the counter. Always tell your patients to avoid those homemade products, boric acid solution, chamomile tea compresses, etc. Replace the cap on the eye drops immediately and tighten it down. Remind the patient to throw out any of the unused eye drops at the end of a treatment course. And it's best not to write antibiotic refill drops. What will happen then, the patient becomes involved in self-diagnosis. If you add a refill to, say, an Ocuflox eye drop, and the patient just hangs on to that refill, and then they'll use it again, well, that's considered self-diagnosing. It's similar to the reason we don't want to put refills on antibiotic prescriptions, because the patients then self-diagnose. Let's talk about a treatable condition over the counter, and that is allergic conjunctivitis.
The treatment goals for allergic conjunctivitis treatment are to remove or avoid the allergen, as we do with all types of allergic reactions. We'll provide symptomatic relief, we'll try to limit the allergy reaction, and protect the ocular surface. Pharmacologic therapy for allergic conjunctivitis is artificial tears. We want to protect the surface of the eye first of all. Then if symptoms persist, we can switch it up to an ophthalmic antihistamine mast cell stabilizer. If there's no resolution within 72 hours after using the antihistamine mast cell stabilizer, then we'll need to get in contact with the eye care practitioner. Non-pharmacologic therapy, tell your patients that they should not be wearing their contact lenses until the issue is resolved, and they can apply cool compresses or cold compresses three to four times a day. Pollen can cause allergic conjunctivitis, as can animal dander and topical eye preps. Two of my kids are very allergic to cats, especially long-haired cats, so when they go to any of the relatives' house that have cats, their eyes are going to swell. So they'll pre-treat maybe with Zyrtec or Benadryl and use an eye drop before going into the house. The symptoms we're familiar with, it's a red eye with a watery discharge and can cause sometimes intense itching. All right, let's talk about allergic conjunctivitis and treatment with decongestants. Now, if we can use topical antihistamines, we can also use the topical decongestants. Ophthalmic decongestants, they work by constricting those conjunctival vessels and reduce redness. They work on alpha adrenergic receptors of the ophthalmic vasculature. And the drugs that we'll use for that are phenylephrine, oxymetazoline, nefazoline, and tetrahydrazoline. And very similar to the topical products that we use for nasal congestion, we can also see rebound congestion on the eyes. As we use drugs like Afrin and C, rhinitis medicamentosa, we can also see the same rebound congestion occurring with topical therapy on the eyes. The ocular decongestant side effects, generally there's not a whole lot of them, but we can see rebound conjunctival hyperemia. We can see allergic blepharitis and abnormal dryness. Now, we will see less rebound congestion with nefazoline and tetrahydrazoline as we will with the other two, the phenylephrine and oxymetazoline. So nefazoline and tetrahydrazoline are going to be a better choice if rebound congestion is a problem. Allergic conjunctivitis, we have some precautions we need to take into account if we are going to use those decongestants. For the ocular decongestants, you shouldn't use them in patients with systemic hypertension, arteriosclerosis, narrow angle glaucoma, diabetes, hyperthyroidism, and use sparingly, if at all, in our pregnant patients. The typical dose for decongestants are one or two drops up to four times a day. Oxymetazoline is longer acting and it's generally administered twice a day. And even though the typical dose is listed as one or two drops, we know the eye can only hold one drop at a time. As far as treatment with the antihistamines go, the mechanism of action are their receptor antagonists similar to the antihistamines that we swallow. Uh, phenyramine, and antazoline phosphate are histamine 1 receptor antagonists, antihistamines. Uh, they're available in combination with the decongestants uh, combined with nefazoline. And they're more effective than e either agent alone. And very similar to treatment with the oral medications, when we combine an antihistamine and a decongestant, we get a better effect than using either agent alone. Also for treatment of allergic conjunctivitis, we have an antihistamine mast cell stabilizer. And the one that's over the counter that we're familiar with is Ketotifen. Zatador was the first brand name, but there's also other ones available in uh, the generics as well. Ketotifen is a potent H1 receptor antagonist, and it also affects the mast cells. Mast cell degranulation is inhibited, and it blocks the release of inflammatory mediators. 
We'll see relief within minutes that lasts up to 12 hours. We can use this product in children three years of age and older. So it's been a real blessing having that over the counter. Most of us seasoned pharmacists remember when Zatador was indeed a brand name available on prescription only, and they brought it out front and the price dropped from like 70 bucks down to about 12 to $14. Very effective drug. Patinol is available RX only, and it's indicated for the prevention of itching due to allergic conjunctivitis. Olipatidine Pataday is also available as a prescription. Notice it's twice the strength and we'll dose that just one drop in each eye every 24 hours. And Bepreve is available. Bepotastine is available as one drop in the affected eye twice a day. So whether it's Zatador, Patinol, Pataday, or Bepreve, they're all antihistamine mast cell stabilizers, but Zatador is the only one that's available over the counter. A very common form of eye redness is viral conjunctivitis, commonly referred to as pink eye. It's the most common form of conjunctivitis. In adults, 80% of all pink eye is due to a viral etiology. In children, it's about half and half, half bacteria, half virus. It is highly contagious for about one week, and some of the precursors are a recent cold, a sore throat, or exposure to someone with pink eye. And how many times do we have our patients refer to this as they had a cold in their eye, they had that cold in their throat and they coughed a whole lot and now the cold moved to their eye. And that's kind of where the uh, cold in the eye came from. Usually as a precursor, we'll see that the patients had some sort of a upper respiratory viral infection. The goals of therapy for viral conjunctivitis or pink eye is to relieve those symptoms while the infection runs its course. And those symptoms are a watery discharge, conjunctival redness and swelling. They'll have some ocular discomfort with the mild to moderate sensation of a foreign object in the eye. It feels like there's sand in the eye. There's something grainy in there. There's something that they can feel inside their eye that's causing this uh, itching sensation and they might even see blurred vision as well. It is self-limiting and the symptoms will resolve within one to three weeks. For the symptomatic relief of viral conjunctivitis, we can recommend artificial tear preparations or ocular decongestants. Let's review some counseling points for viral conjunctivitis or pink eye. Proper hygiene is extremely important. We need to encourage our patients to wash their hands after touching their eyes avoid sharing towels, and discard used tissues. I even tell my patients that if they have those community bathrooms where the kids and the parents are using the same bathroom, take out all the hand towels and put in a roll of paper towels. Also discard any used tissues. Cold compresses will provide some relief of itching and avoid wearing contact lenses and uh, replace them after having pink eye. Clinical pearls on conjunctivitis treatment. Worsening of symptoms during topical treatment with any antibiotic may represent a contact allergic reaction, especially with neosporin or any of the sulfonamides. It might not very well be a worsening of the infection. It could be a contact allergic reaction. Conjunctivitis due to Neisseria gonorrhea may be considered in the sexually active adult with a thick, prominent, and copious discharge of the eye. Neisseria species are capable of invading an intact corneal epithelium. In earlier mild cases of bacterial conjunctivitis, symptoms may be limited to a mild conjunctival injection without frank purulent drainage that's evident to the clinician. Therefore, empiric antibiotic therapy is warranted in most cases of conjunctivitis. This next slide, we have a chart differentiating between the bacterial, viral, and allergic conjunctivitis. And it's the discharge is what really seems to separate them. For the viral and allergic conjunctivitis, it can be clear and watery. However, if it's stringy, white, and very thick and mucousy, that could be allergic. If it's very purulent, 
that's going to be bacterial. If we notice that burning and redness is common along with swelling for all three of the conditions, this chart should be very useful for you in helping you differentiate between allergic or bacterial or viral. Infectious conjunctivitis does need treatment. Infectious conjunctivitis is a bacterial conjunctivitis that'll start in one eye and spread to the other. Keep in mind, allergic will present in both eyes, whereas infectious will start in one eye and it generally moves across to the other. The signs are redness, swelling, an itchy, painful eye with a thick discharge, often a yellow or green color, usually thick, gooey, crusty in the morning and dried upon wakening in the morning. And a lot of times the eyelashes can have the eye matted shut. Most common pathogen, Streptococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, and Staphylococcus aureus. The treatment will consist of antibiotic eye drops or ointments giving several times per day. Warm, wet compresses are soothing to the patients, and a lot of times that'll just help soften up that crusty stuff on the eyelids and help uh, clean the eyelids off. Don't wear contact lenses until all signs of infection are gone. Some of the drug therapy for infectious conjunctivitis, we really should avoid sodium sulfacetamide. Sulamid was the old brand by Sharing Labs. Keep in mind that there's probably not a more potent sensitizer than the sulfa drugs. There's probably not a more sensitive mucous membrane on our body than our eye. So we're going to take the most potent sensitizer on the most sensitive mucous membrane and combine them. Not a good idea. Many allergic reactions are confused with therapeutic failures. It's not an ideal choice for conjunctivitis. About the only time it should be used for conjunctivitis is for treatment of trachoma. Gentamicin and tobramycin are both aminoglycosides that can be used and they're available as solutions and ointments and they have excellent coverage of gram-negative and gram-positive organisms. They can be used every four hours and more frequently if it's severe. Tobradex is that combination of tobramycin plus dexamethasone. That's available also as a drop in an ointment. Non-specialists in ophthalmology should avoid using this combination due to a chance of a herpes infection. And if we treat a herpes infection with a topical corticosteroid, we can have all kinds of problems with the herpes infection just going crazy. So it is best that only optometrists and ophthalmologists that are trained in the treatment and diagnosing of eye diseases should be using Tobradex or any topical corticosteroid. Bacitrace and ophthalmic ointment can be used. It does have good gram-positive coverage it does have minimal gram-negative coverage, and it was named as the 2003 Allergen of the Year. And that Allergen of the Year award is given by the American Contact Dermatitis Association. Probably shouldn't be too quick to be using bacitracin as well as the sulfas. Drug therapy for infectious conjunctivitis also includes azacite or azithromycin, which is a real thick uh, suspension that can be used on the eye one drop every 12 hours for two days, then once a day for the next five days. I kind of think of that drug as a Z-pack for the eyes. Erythromycin, ophthalmic ointment, we'll use that a good bit, and that's for the treatment of uh, superficial ocular infections that are involving the conjunctiva or the cornea caused by susceptible organisms. It is commonly used for prevention of ophthalmalia neonatorium caused by Neisseria gonorrhea or Chlamydia trachomata. Still use that in the eyes of a newborn right after birth as opposed to the old um, silver sticks that they used to use, the silver nitrate swabs. Trimeth polymyxin B can be used also for mild to moderate infections and we'll use one drop every three hours for a maximum of six doses per day for seven to 10 days. Fluoroquinolone therapy is probably the most commonly used eye drops today for bacterial conjunctivitis. We have siloxin or ciprofloxacin, 
ofloxacin or ocufloc. Ciprofloxacin is generally considered to be that first generation fluoroquinolone. Ofloxacin is considered to be like the second generation. Quixin, probably the third, and then Vigamox, Zymar, Zymaxid, and Besavance are all considered to be for the fourth generation fluoroquinolone therapies. Moexa is also another one that's available, and that's pretty much used in the optometrist, ophthalmologist's office. They use it because it has a xanthan gum base, and that helps the drug adhere longer to the eye. Haven't seen it yet in retail practice, but uh, my consultants do tell me they will use it in the office setting. And again, the Moexa is moxifloxacin, a fourth generation fluoroquinolone. Blepharitis can be detected by the redness of the eyelids. It can be manifested as burning, itching, and scaling skin. And the under prob underlying problem is generally a seborrheic dermatitis, that redness, itching, or it could be a staph aureus as well. Staph aureus needs to be treated, and it responds rather nicely to the bacitrace and ophthalmic ointment. For the seborrheic blepharitis, washing the eyelids with baby shampoo, warm compresses, and we can even instill artificial tears directly into the eye if the eyes are dry. But for the most part, we can scrub the lids with uh, the old Johnson & Johnson's baby shampoo and wash the eyelid off, and that seems to respond rather nicely. A sty in the eye is an infection of the sebaceous gland of the eyelid, generally a staph infection, and that can't be treated with OTC therapy. Yes, I know many of us have a product in the eye section called STY, S-T-Y-E, but that contains just white petrolatum. Helps protect the surface of the eye, but it is not going to help with the infection. Really discourage your patients from messing with it, poking it with pins, trying to break that open and drain it. Let's let that up to the optometrist or ophthalmologist. Some patients do require antibiotic therapy, therapy for sty treatment. Another disease state that we pharmacists commonly treat in the retail setting is glaucoma. And glaucoma causes damage to the eye's optic nerve associated with a buildup of pressure inside the eye. Glaucoma tends to be inherited and may not show up until later on in life. When we have these elevations of intraocular pressure, it can cause damage to the optic nerve, which transmits those images to the brains. They call it the silent killer of the eyes. If damage to the optic nerve from high pressure continues, glaucoma will cause a permanent loss of vision. Without treatment, glaucoma can cause total permanent blindness within a few years. The normal range for interocular pressure is between 12 and 22 millimeters of mercury. Most glaucoma cases are diagnosed with pressure exceeding 20 millimeters of mercury. However, some people can have glaucoma damage at pressures between 12 and 22. Eye pressure is unique to each patient, so again, consultation with an optometrist ophthalmologist is really critical for monitoring this disease state. How do we test for glaucoma? Well, there are five different tests that can be done in our optometrist or ophthalmologist's office. Uh, the first thing we can do is we can examine the inner eye pressure, and the name of that test is tonometry. Uh, trained clinicians can also check out the shape and color of the optic nerve uh, with a dilated eye exam uh, with ophthalmoscopy. They can also do that complete field of vision test, which is called perimetry. And some of us older uh, pharmacists have used that. That's where they hand you the button and you look for the squiggles. And the minute you see the squiggle come in, you hit the button. That's testing the field of vision. And that's also another glaucoma test. They can also test the angle in the eye, which the iris meets the cornea, which is called gonioscopy. And they can also monitor the thickness of the cornea, which is called pactimetry. So many of us have had these tests done, probably didn't know what they were when our optometrist or ophthalmologist was doing that for us. So before the age of 40, those tests should be done every two to four years. Between age 40 and 54, 
They should be done as frequently as every one to three years. At age 55 to 64, every one to two years. And once you're age 65 and above, it should be done every half year to one year. As I approach the age of 55, I'm very glad we're going to have a clinician in the family. Closed angle glaucoma is an emergency. Fortunately, though, it accounts for about 5% or less of primary glaucomas. In chronic closed angle glaucoma, we have a complete obstruction of the aqueous into the anterior chamber of the eye. When the CAG occurs, uh, it must be treated as an ophthalmologic emergency. It has to be treated now to avoid any kind of vision loss. This is an emergency. So if a patient is complaining of severe pain and they have a profound vision loss and they have halo around the uh, uh, lights, they need to be referred immediately. If they have a hazy edematous cornea, a red eye, a dilated pupil, they need to have treatment immediately. They can also have nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diaphoresis, or sweating. In pr the prolonged attacks, vision loss occurs if the IOP is high enough. Tonometry will reveal an IOP as high as 40 to 90. Keep in mind we treat IOP at 20 to 22. With this closed angle glaucoma, we can see it as high as 40 to 90 millimeters of mercury. The treatment is rapid reduction in IOP to preserve vision loss. Older age people are much more affected by it. Uh, hyperopes can be affected by it as well. And our Asian population, primarily the Chinese, can have as high as 30% incidence in closed angle glaucoma. Treatment of closed angle glaucoma, we got to get that pressure down immediately. So the clinicians will give a single dose of acetazolamide, Diamox is the brand name, IV followed by the 250 milligram four times a day, or they can treat with mannitol, urea, or glycerol, anything to pull down that eye pressure. Once the IOP has started to fall, they'll use topical pilocarpine. An old glaucoma drug us older pharmacists are familiar with, and you'll use one drop in the eye 15 minutes apart for one hour and then four times a day. And what that treatment with pilocarpine will do was it'll make the pupil shrink, it makes the iris bigger, so that when they do their laser peripheral iridotomy, they'll have a bigger field to work with by closing the pupil, makes the iris bigger, and they have a bigger target to put those holes directly into the iris. And as you can see from this slide, you see that hole there at about 12 o'clock. That procedure should be done prophylactically in the other eye as well. But that's how it's treated in the clinician's office. Open angle glaucoma, we're much more familiar with this. And open, open angle glaucoma is a chronic disease primarily treated with topical drugs. The primary defect is that reduction in drainage of the aqueous humor in the canal of Schlem. I tell my students, think of it as putting your foot over the drain of a shower. The water increases and the pressure builds up. The cause is not clearly understood, although genetic mutations have been identified in a small number of cases. It's physiologically determined by the relative production and elimination of the aqueous humor. That's that clear liquid that fills the anterior and the chamber of the eye. We are constantly making and draining this aqueous humor. We have a constant flow of two to three microliters per minute and that's what maintains the physiological IOP. So we're always making new aqueous humor and we're always draining it out. So if we're making too much or draining too little, we're going to have an increase in intraocular pressure. We have some drugs that can ele elevate our intraocular pressure. For open angle glaucoma, ophthalmic corticosteroids do pose the highest risk. They affect the drainage through the trabecular network at the canal of Schlem. Systemic corticosteroids and topical corticosteroids 
also can raise IOP, and nasal and inhaled corticosteroids can all do that. However, the ophthalmic topical corticosteroids are your highest risk. We also have drugs that can cause closed angle glaucoma, and the anticholinergics either topically or systemic can do that. Sympathomimetics, like our good friend Sudafed, can do that. Low potency phenothiazines because of their anticholinergic effects. First generation antihistamines because of their anticholinergic effects. And ipratropium can all, due to anticholinergic effects or sympathomimetic activities, can all cause closed angle glaucoma, which is a medical emergency. So what are some options we can use for topical corticosteroid therapy if we're unable to use those directly in the eye? Well, prednisolone acetate 1% causes a significant elevation in IOP, so our best option would be Lodoprednol or Lodomax or Alrex are available as ophthalmic suspensions. 72% of patients treated with lodopredinol experienced resolution of anterior chamber cells compared to 87% of patients treated with prednisolone acetate 1%. So the prednisolone is going to be a little bit more effective, 87% versus 72%. However, the changes in the IOP was significant as well. The incidence of patients with clinically significant increases in IOP, anything greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, was 1% with lodoprednol and 6% with prednisolone acetate. So the prednisolone acetate will cause elevations in IOP six times more frequently than what happened with Lodomax or Lodoprednol. Lodoprednol should not be used in patients who require more potent corticosteroid for this indication. And Lodoprednol is available as drops, also as a gel, and also as an ointment. We have to be cautious with those ophthalmic corticosteroids because they can delay healing and they can also uh, cause an increase in perforations in those patients with diseases that can cause corneal and scleral thinning. Again, practitioners that are trained in ophthalmology are the only ones that should be writing for corticosteroid therapy. Let's have an overview of drug therapy for the treatment of these elevated intraocular pressures. We have drugs that decrease the production of aqueous humor. We have beta blockers, timolol, batoxolol, cartiolol, and levobunolol are all topical beta blockers. We also have some alpha agonists that are available, epinephrine, dipivifrin, apraclonidine, and bromonidine, keeping in mind epinephrine is not available on the U.S. market. And we also have some carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. We have acetazolamide and methazolamide, which are both oral forms. And then brinzolamide and dorazolamide are the topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And the beta blockers, alpha agonists, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors all slow up the production of aqueous humor. We also have drugs that facilitate that drainage of the aqueous humor, similar to removing your foot off of the drain when the water builds up in your shower. So what we can do to sort of unclog that drain, we can use myotics like carbacol and pilocarpine, two very old drugs. We can use prostaglandins, latanoprost, travaprost, bimatoprost, and also the alpha agonists of epinephrine, dipivifrine, and bromonidine also can facilitate drainage at the aqueous humor, as well as decreased production of the aqueous humor. Let's talk about the beta blockers first. Beta blockers were indeed a godsend when they first came on the market because they don't have any effect on pupil size or accommodation. They decrease the production of the aqueous humor by the ciliary body, presumably by decreasing the action of circulating epinephrine without producing substantial effects on aqueous humor outflow. So they slow up the formation of the aqueous humor. The good news is they don't affect pupil size. And uh, that being said, they have minimal therapeutic effect during the night. And the reason that is, is because we are kind of less active with our epinephrine at night, so beta blockers aren't as effective on the eye during the night. 
We have to be cautious with these. Uh, if you're using topical beta blockers in cardio or pulmo patients, your asthma patients or your cardiac patients, we can see bradycardia occur as well as bronchospasms. There is one that is selective and betoxolol is the name or betoptic is the most selective beta blocker. It has minimal side effects on cardiovascular and pulmonary parameters. It is beta-1 selective, and its dose is one drop in the affected eye twice a day. We also have Timoptic, both gel-forming solution and regular solution. The gel-forming solution is dosed once a day. It's a liquid that once it hits the eye, it turns into a gel. And Timoptic solution is dosed twice a day, and both of these are available generically, and we encourage our optometrists, ophthalmologists to be very specific with these because there is a potential for a dispensing error. Betagan 0.25 and levobunolol 0.5 are dosed twice a day, as is Ocupress twice a day. Alpha agonists are also available, and as we said, they decrease formation of the aqueous humor and increase the outflow of the aqueous humor. Aproclonidine or iopidine decreases the aqueous production and has no effect on outflow. And for the most part, Iopidine is going to be used for acute IOP lowering, generally not used for maintenance, and you'll see it used a lot of time in the ophthalmologist's office. Alpha-GAN P or bromonidine, uh, we have a new additional strength of 0.1% along with the 0.15%, so again, we have to be cautious for dispensing errors with that. And one drop's gonna be used in the affected eye three times a day. Propene or dipiprofen is one drop every 12 hours, and that's a prodrug of epinephrine. Epinephrine's no longer available in the United States, and iopidine very seldom is going to be used in a retail situation. That's going to be used in the physician's offices. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors inhibit carbonic anhydrase in the ciliary process of the eye. They decrease the aqueous humor secretions. They're sulfonamides. So keep in mind what happens when we use sulfonamides, those very potent sensitizers on the sensitive mucous membrane of the eye. They are administered topically and they can be absorbed systemically. So we wanna watch for signs of hypersensitivity. They do have a horrible taste, so we encourage patients after installation to pinch the bridge of their nose for about 30 seconds after administration. Dorzolamid or Trusopt is available generically, and that's going to be used one drop three times a day. Azopt or Brinzonamid is also available as a brand name, and that dose is one drop three times a day. We can also use an oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, acetazolamide or diamox, and that's dosed 250 milligrams one to four times a day. There's also the SR capsules, known as diamox sequels, dosed at 500 milligrams twice a day. They can be very useful as an add-on, but we do need to watch for hypokalemia and probably need to supplement with potassium. Biotics such as pilocarpine seem to be used today mostly in the recalcitrant patients. Uh, their mechanism of action is their parasympathomimetics, which duplicates the muscarinic effects of acetylcholine. They constrict the pupil, they stimulate the ciliary muscles, and they increase the aqueous humor outflow. It causes that increased tension on the scleral spur. It kind of pulls it away from the trabecular mesh work and then facilitates drainage of the aqueous humor. Uh, problems with these drugs, and that's why we don't use them anymore, they really decrease visual acuity and night visions. Lens opacity may occur, it can cause headaches, and individuals with very pigmented irides may require higher strength. So currently it's only going to be used for laser peripheral iridotomy. I do have a patient, though, that is currently using pilocarpine 4% because that's the only thing that can get his pressure down. And my grandfather back in the 70s used this a whole lot uh, for his interocular pressure, and he always complained that he couldn't see anything. He had to go outside on the porch to read the newspaper. However, when he was outside, he could see birds at his bird feeding uh, breaking up seeds. So grandpa could see outside, but he couldn't see inside. And now it all makes sense because his pupil was always very 
very constricted from the pilocarpine. Prostanoids, they're the go-to drug for topical treatment of glaucoma. They are number one, first choice, pretty much hands down. And they lower IOP by increasing outflow of the aqueous humor. What are we going to tell our patients? Well, these can change the color of the iris. It'll change the iris from blue to brown, or it'll make light eyes even darker. It'll also cause eyelash and eyelid changes. It can cause some thickening and darkening as well. And all products are dosed once a day at bedtime in the affected eye. And we're all familiar with Zalatan, which is available as a generic drug now. The other ones are all available as brand names. We keep Zalatan in the refrigerator until it's dispensed. After we dispense it, it can be used at room temperature for up to six weeks by our patients. Travitan Z, Lumagan, and Zyoptan are all available as well. The Zyoptan is preservative free and it comes in those single dose containers. Latisse is also a prostanoid, but we use that as a cosmetic. It's the first drug approved for increasing eyelash growth. It takes about eight weeks to work and the eyelashes do return to normal a few weeks or months after we stop treatment. It darkens the iris and the skin around the eyes and you have to tell your patients to wait about 15 minutes before reinserting contact lenses. I have never had Latisse approved by any insurance company because they consider it to be a cosmetic and once our patients see the price of Latisse they usually don't buy it. We can also use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for the eye. Acular or Keterolac is available as a prescription and Acular LS is available as 0.4% for ocular pain and stinging and burning after the corneal refractive surgery. Indicated for relief of ocular itching caused by seasonal allergic conjunctivitis and we can use one drop four times a day. So the LS is going to be used for refractive surgery and the 0.5 is generally going to be used for conjunctivitis. Volterran ophthalmic solution um, is used for post-op inflammation after corneal extraction. Photophobia and pain can occur and it can cause corneal melting. The cornea can actually melt. So uh, all of the NSAIDs have a potential for it. Volterran is the worst. Nevenac doesn't cause corneal melting as frequently and Bromde is probably one of our safest for uh, risk for corneal melting. Uh, Bromde is also indicated for treatment of post-op inflammation and reduction of ocular pain in patients who have done the cataract extraction. And I have all the dosages listed on this slide for you. Treatment of dry eyes is indeed a problem and one of the most asked for drugs for treatment of dry eyes is Restasis. They do a lot of direct to patient uh, consumer marketing. The Restasis is cyclosporin and remember cyclosporin we used to use in the old days for uh, kidney rejection. It is available in boxes of 32 vials. Uh, we'll use one drop in each eye twice a day and it is an immunomodulator. It decreases inflammation in patients with keratoconjunctivitis, which can cause a decrease in tear production. So it is indicated to increase tear production in our patients. We'll see uh, cautions, adverse effects. With our patients, we can see ocular burning as high as 17%, and we have to be very cautious with herpes keratitis, because again, it being an immunosuppressant, it could make herpes keratitis significantly worse. It is available as single dose vials and it should be discarded immediately after each use. As expensive as this drug is, it still shouldn't be saved and used twice a day. It should only be used once and then discarded. Contact lenses may be inserted 15 minutes after the eye drops Patients with dry eyes are not ideal candidate for contact lens therapy anyways. We also have oral medications that can cause ophthalmological conditions. We have drugs that can cause corneal and conjunctival disturbances. Chlorpromazine, thioridazine, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, lovastatin can encourage the progression of cataracts, indomethacin, and ambiodarone are all implicated in causing corneal and conjunctival disturbances.
We also have some drugs that can cause direct retinopathy. Uh, the disease state of diabetes mellitus can cause retinopathy. And a lot of times, uh, skilled optometrists and ophthalmologists will pick up on pre-diabetes before the patient even is on medication or is seeking help from their clinician. They'll see those changes in their eyes. Methanol or moonshine can also cause retinopathy. Chloroquine, indomethacin, tamoxifen, and phenothiazines can all cause retinopathy as well. We also have some oral medications that can cause optic neuropathy, ethambutol for tuberculosis, chloroquine, quinine, and quinidine can all cause optic neuropathy. We also have drugs that can cause visual disturbances. Digoxin can do it. Uh, Appetite suppression is always the first sign of dig toxicity, but the second sign would be when the patient looks at a light, they see a halo around it. Oral contraceptives can cause color visual disturbances, ethambutol, and our good friend Viagra. That's why a lot of pilots are not allowed to use Viagra before flying an airplane because you're not able to discriminate between red and green. And when you're up in an airplane and you look down to an airport when you're landing, we have the green lights for the runway and the blue lights for the terminal. We wouldn't want those two to be confused by our pilot. <laughs> There's also another condition, kind of unique, called IFIS, intraoperative iris, floppy iris syndrome. And we have some drugs that can cause IFIS, and it's all the alpha-1 blockers that we'll use for our prostate patients or hypertension. What happens is the iris becomes flaccid and floppy. It, it billows in response to the irrigation currents uh, when we're doing intraoperative surgery. And what can happen is the potential prolapse of the iris during the phacoemulsification process. So what can happen is while the ophthalmologist is doing this eye surgery, and if he doesn't know it ahead of time, the iris can become very, very floppy, and it's very hard to work, and that can become a, a medical emergency. It's not a problem, though, if the ophthalmologist know in advance. They use this special device called iris hooks, and I have them on this slide. They look pretty scary to me. Um, this IFIS can be caused by alpha blockers like Flomax that we'll see in our prostate patients, Cardura, Doxazacin, or Terazacin. Ophthalmologists can modify their surgical techniques. They use these iris hooks or eyeless dilatation rings or viscoelastic devices to kind of stabilize that iris before they do the surgery. The ophthalmologist must know before the surgery that the patient has been on alpha blocker therapy and the usual protocol is to stop the medication seven to day, 10 days beforehand. What is probably a good idea, so often us pharmacists get those three drugs that uh, we fill the three topical, uh, the antibiotic, the uh, prednisolone, and the Voltaren. We might get the ANSAID and all those before the surgery. Well, when you're filling those three drugs, just kind of scan the patient's profile and see if they're on any of the alpha-1 blockers. And if so, might get you some brownie points to call their ophthalmologist just to make sure he knows ahead of time that they are on. Now, all of the ophthalmologists tell me that they do indeed scan for alpha-1 blocker therapy before they do the surgery. What is the pharmacist's role in eye-specific medications? Well, we need to know when to consult eye care practitioners based on symptomatology, and we covered a lot of the symptoms of the disease states. We also need to know when to not to delay therapy to our patients. Hey, can you wait a couple days till I contact your prescriber to get this switched because it's expensive? We need to know when to and when not to do that. Well, the first uh, step is betoxolol versus timolol. Well, we should never really call an optometrist or an ophthalmologist to switch if that patient is a cardiac patient or if that patient is an asthma or COPD patient because betoxolol, as we learned with this lecture, is much more selective and much safer to give to a cardiac or a pulmonary patient.
Lopredinol versus prednisolone acetate. Uh, I called an optometrist once and said, would it be okay if I would switch from low to max to the Pred Forte generic? It would be a whole lot cheaper for the patient. And that optometrist said to me, yeah, Pete, you can do that as long as the patient comes to my clinic every three hours to have their IOP monitored. He said that low to max is much safer for this particular patient. He was very concerned about elevations in IOP. And you know what? I didn't know that at the time. How about gatafloxacin versus ciprofloxacin? Gatafloxacin is that fourth generation fluoroquinolone. Ciprofloxacin is a first generation. So the gatafloxacin has a much broader spectrum of action, should not be substituted for a first generation fluoroquinolone. And finally, the number one med error that occurs due to dosage forms is dispensing an eardrop for use in the eye. Ophloxacin otic is dispensed for the ophthalmic product. So we have to be very, very careful. And I even go so far now as to write the word I on the prescription and make sure that I have the word I written on the eye drop. That is the number one dosage form dispensing error done by pharmacists. So keep your eyes open for that. Another role that we pharmacists play is in the administration techniques for eye drops. Remind your patient if it's a suspension, shake it well. Wash your hands before using. Do not touch the tip of the eye drop to the eye. Pull down on the lower eyelid to expose that conjunctival sac and it's preferable to drop it in the middle of the conjunctival sac and not on the inner canthus of the eye. Pull down, make the conjunctival sac in the center of the eye. That's the spot where you want to put that eye drop. Multiple drops. The eye can only handle one drop at a time, so we want to wait five minutes between eye drops. No prescription should really ever read two drops three times a day because the first drop will go into the eye, the second one will just wash it out. It may be beneficial to hold the lower lid for one minute after installation and then press the finger against the inner corner of the eye for about a minute to prevent that rapid drainage into the tear ducts. That's called punctal occlusion. And use a tissue only to remove excessive liquid from the eyelid. Another reason too that we don't want to use two drops in the eye, it doubles the cost of therapy, it wastes eye drops, and it will increase the likelihood of systemic absorption. So just one drop in the eye at a time. On the horizon for drug therapy for lowering intraocular pressure are the rokinase inhibitors. And the benefits of uh, rokinase inhibitors are they lower the intraocular pressure by increasing the outflow through the trabecular meshwork. They increase blood flow to the optic nerve and possibly delay optic nerve cell death. So uh, on the horizon, we might see some rokinase inhibitors. Uh, they're abbreviated as R-O-C-Ks, ROCs, and they believe to also have some cardiovascular benefits. So what effect it's going to have on our patients long term, uh, it will be seen once these drugs get on the market. Currently, they're in phase two trials by the FDA.